Tick tock, time to rock. How's everyone going? Sorry, we're uh, a little late. Mike was speaking with uh, Mike um, Jones. Mike Jones of uh, I call him IP. So I've yeah. always confused. Look, whoop, again, I got to turn the sound off, or it's gonna it's gonna be problems. Oh no, never mind. My sound's already off. Man, I'm on the ball. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's Mike Jones of Inspiring Philosophy and Mike Winger. We're speaking over. Um, at a local school, they were there. Uh, I went there um, along with Cameron Bertuzzi and Adam Coleman and Vocab Malone. We were just uh, sitting there listening to these guys as a, as a question uh, Q and A from from all the students. And so, anyway, we had to rush back here, um, but uh, yeah, we, it was a little longer trip than we uh, we had anticipated. Sorry about that. <laughs> but we're back now, and this will be cool because Mike Winger is used to a lot more preparation time than I gave him. As in which is none. any preparation time. <laughs> which is I none. walked in the door less than two minutes ago. <laughs> so it's actually cool because, uh, yeah, if you look at his live streams, he does a lot of preparation. And um, for those of you who, who don't know, I'm assuming most of you know, but uh, we're, we're here all together. Um, a very famous Hall of Fame athlete who has a big house here, but is a devout Christian, allowed us to... Uh, use his house to get together for this meeting, bunch of uh, Christian YouTubers um, getting together, sharing ideas, sharing thoughts, and so on, building an apologetics empire and some... Uh, what, do you, what did you think about this uh, this this week, by the way? Oh, it was really good, man. It was really good. So we're, we're, we're working on strategies on YouTube, understanding the platform better and other networks as well. Uh, but the, the, the best part has just been connecting with my brothers in Christ. That's been really sweet. Just the fellowship getting to hang out and spend time together and build friendships. Um, I know that sounds cheesy, but I'm being, I'm being real. That's just the best part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is, uh, uh, <laughs> I was running people out of the house while Mike was here in front of my uh, laptop. And so he went ahead and typed, I love Mike Winger from, <laughs> from my account, which was funny because he typed something nice like that. When, when I did the same thing to John McRae, uh, either last night or the night before, it's all blurred by now. But uh, I, I saw John McRae's laptop was open when he was trying to run someone out so so he could go live. And uh, so I typed something like, uh, David Wood is the greatest, unlike me, John McRae, I suck, or something like that. I posted that on his live stream. So uh, this guy's a little bit, little bit nicer than <laughs> I am. Which isn't saying all that much, actually. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, we're here, we're gathered together, a bunch of Christian YouTubers trying to figure out strategies, um, how to uh, basically uh, make take, sure. Take over. How to take yeah, over. How to take over. Uh, take over the internet, baptize the entire internet. <laughs> and uh, no, it's just because, you know, as, mu as much as we learn along the way, there's so much to learn on YouTube that we, we, there, there's, there's, there are always things we don't know, but other people do know them. And so by getting together, we can... Uh, sort of pick each other's brains and figure things out. And uh, this goal is not just for us to up our games. It's uh, for us to first up our games and then use what we learn to help everyone else who wants to get on YouTube. So, That's right. Um, we are looking forward to the next generation. I believe, Mike, I don't know about you. I believe, see, we. I, I had to learn this. I don't know about you. I was locked up when the technological revolution was was going on as far as the internet. And so, and even then, you know, video making, when I decided I had to, I wanted to do it, I knew nothing about it. I was completely clueless. So I had to learn this stuff mm. when I was already grown and set in my ways and had to force myself to learn these other things. But this next generation is going to grow up in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're going to, we're going to show you how to do it good. And then you're going to do it better. Mm -hmm. That's the plan. And we're going to support you in it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely. We, uh, I, I look forward to people. <laughs> It seems like there are always people in this world who they get established and then they're, they're actually worried about the next generation that's going to come along and displace them, right? Because then, you know, then they're irrelevant stuff. I look forward to it. I look forward to being old and just... Yeah, because I want to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Stop studying all the time. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to rest and just look back and see people just crushing it better than, better than, yeah. better than I've ever done it. Yeah, yeah. And, and for Christian YouTubers, we can't look at it this as, as a competition. I yeah. mean, it's... You can't even look at it like that, man. I, we want everybody out there with all their variety going for it. And if and if and if in the course of this, like let's say that you see someone else and you like their stuff better than ours, well, good. It blesses you more than ours. Then you should be there. You know, mm -hmm. go for it. So uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, and you know the thing is, I believe Christians can do it. You know what I mean? I believe the Christians can actually 
get along and work together. You atheists, I'm not sure about you. I think you will eat each other alive and tear each other apart. Because we would if it wasn't for Jesus. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you Muslims, when I, when I see you guys, you're, you know, you, you guys are calling each other heretics and kafirs and everything else because you have these disagreements and so on. So guys, I'm starting to think that we might be the only ones who can unite. Now, feel free to prove me wrong. Feel free to prove me wrong. But it's kind of like if they go out and do it now, they're just copying. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're just kind of copying us. <laughs> it's all right. You guys can copy. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking. We, we have lots of uh, we have lots of greetings from from people around the world. Uh, and that's uh, that's awesome. It's always awesome. It, is, it never stops amazing me, the technology and how uh, people can be greeting us from all across the country yeah. and all over the world. That person's um, all the way over at the Flat Earth. Yeah. And guys, just just so you know, if you're if you're coming in here saying Earth is flat and trying to distract people. I do, <laughs> guys. That that I, I've already, I, I don't bye. even give a warning for that anymore. Uh, so bye. <laughs> Try tr troll somewhere else. Go find another live stream to troll in. All right. So uh, guys, we um, normally Mike in, on his live streams he uh, t discusses a topic for a while. What do you do about thirty to forty minutes? Yeah, like anywhere, you know, depending on the topic, sometimes it's longer. But yeah, thirty to forty minutes of like like teaching time where I just go through the topic straight through. I want that to be a really valuable evergreen, you know, teaching moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, then you take, you take questions towards the end. Now yes. me, uh, sometimes I'll just go Q and a and uh, I'll just, you know, I'll be, I'll usually be on with someone else like vocab or Sam Shamoon or uh, the apostate prophet. And we'll just take questions the entire time. So we're kind of going to do things a, a little bit in between, right? Yeah. How do so, you want to do it? Yeah. So basically, um, we'll dedicate this first half hour or so uh, to talking about the issue, but I might, if I see some some really cool questions along the way, might jump in with some of those. And then uh, once we've gotten through uh, the issue at hand, then we will then we will um, take some just just focus on some questions. Uh, someone's right. asking, David, why do you wear a necklace? I don't know because I think it's cool. It's got a, got a cross. Why wouldn't I? It's like it's like you know. Why, why, why am I wearing a blue shirt? You know, there's, no, there's not a reason. I just like it. Well, I mean, it's blue. Yeah. I mean, blue is blue. Mm -hmm. It is the best color. All right. So uh, we are talking about a one of the most important topics in Christianity, right? I mean, yeah. this would be this would be how, how significant is Jesus death for sins in Christianity? If you were to rank the doctrines, I'm not <laughs> sure you can rank. I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can say certain. A uh, small handful in in terms of which one is most important, but yeah. what 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 where would this be on the scale of doctrines here? Uh, in my opinion, it's the top, it's on the top tier. You know, it's it's in the the highest ranking doctrines of Christianity. Where like some doctrines, we go, hey, we disagree, but we can hold hands. Like you're still a Christian. Like there's no you know none of that kind of craziness going on. And then some doctrines are like, yeah, that's that's so essential that you're not that's not even Christianity anymore. Um, and, and in this case, we're talking about the, the death of Christ and what it means. And so there's elements of this that you could say certain elements of the death of Christ. You could go, okay, I'm not going to nitpick on that. But mm -hmm. other, other ones seem like they're really essential to the meaning of how Jesus saves us. And Jesus saving us, well, it's as important as Jesus saving us. I mean, I don't know what else to compare it to. Yeah. So this is, this is way up there. Yeah. So, the, yeah, so there, are, there are lots of issues where we could say we could disagree as Christians. Yeah. And so, you know, you could be a uh, Calvinist or Arminian and so on. We'd still say you're a Christian. You could be young earth, old earth. We'd still say you're a Christian. They're mm -hmm. all, there's room for all sorts of disagreement, but mm -hmm. there are certain issues where if you rejected it, we would say you're just, you're, you're not a, you're not a Christian. This would be, this would be in that category. Mm -hmm. All right. So, hey, why are they so loud out there? Hey, right, tell them to be quiet. What the heck is wrong with them? Anytime you got vocab Malone 10 feet away from you, even if he's on the other side of a, of a wall, uh, it's going to be noisy. All right. Says David Wood. <laughs> so now there, there, are, there are all kinds of directions that we can go in discussing this. Brett, come around here and say hi to everyone. Come, come wave to everyone. <laughs> so we forced most people out, but Brett just came in. What's up, everyone? <laughs> How's it going on? Here we have Maven. Do you do you now? You always wear your Maven shirt, but but do you have uh do you have the full collection of uh, Ben Shapiro shirts? That's my oh. guy. Uh, almost. <laughs> yeah. Facts don't care about your feelings. Jesus. No, no, no. Oh, no, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it says Jesus. Oh, oh. that would have been that would have been, been hilarious. Um, so yeah. Uh, 
Oh yeah, so th so there are, there are lots of different ways we could go about this, right? Because yeah. we have uh, you know what Jesus said, we have what mm -hmm. Jesus said, mm -hmm. we have sort of old the the Old Testament, Old Testament prophecies, yeah. um, the Old Testament sacrificial system, and so on. We mm -hmm. have uh, post post New Testament, we have the, the the early church fathers because they were wrestling. A lot of the church fathers were wrestling with how to understand jesus death right like 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 what the they do talk about the, it they do talk about yeah. it and 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 when this topic comes up of of the meaning of the death of christ people often misrepresent the church fathers so in what's called the secondary literature the people writing about the church fathers mm -hmm. frequently totally misrepresent these guys and in particular it's the people who are against a biblical doctrine who misrepresent them it's almost you know sometimes when people have an unbiblical teaching they want to hijack the church fathers and say see i found it in them so i'm right and uh, that's kind of what goes on there, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, look, Anthony Rogers here, he said, Ha, that is funny. I kept trying to figure out if someone created a sock puppet account because I know David doesn't talk like that. <laughs> saying, I, uh, I figured those who knew you would be like, what? He's referring to uh, <laughs> to my account saying, I love Mike Winger, which was typed by uh, Mike, Mike Winger here when I wasn't looking. I do love Mike Winger. I, I was mean, over there, there yelling at everyone, <laughs> telling them to get outside. He was over here uh, seizing my account. I, I right. do love myself. I yes. <laughs> this, is, this is sad but true. All right, so on this topic, um, how do you want to start? Would you like to start with uh, claims of Jesus or the Church Fathers or Old Testament? Um, I, I think we should start with the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I think I like that too because that's yeah. you know we're get, that, then you're going kind of chronological, right? Yeah, and and I think because when Jesus calls himself Messiah, when he calls him, when he indicates that he's the Messiah, he's indicating that the way to interpret who he is and what he's doing is through the Old Testament. Like mm -hmm. he's tying himself. He's hitching himself to the Old Testament. Like you can't do anything else about this. Mm -hmm. And so um, understanding Jesus is going to require being consistent with the scriptures that God has revealed up until then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this is also this is also uh, really awesome because it's kind of if if you show that this is connected to the Old Testament, this flows out of the Old Testament, Old Testament prophecy or Old Testament doctrine. It's kind of relevant to a lot of different groups. So this would be relevant to Jews who uh, who believe in the Old Testament, but not the New Testament. If yeah. you can actually show, no, I can show you from the Old Testament. We've got That's some fine. stuff here that you need to think about. Mm -hmm. um, Muslims who whose uh, book, the Quran, requires them to believe in both the Torah and the gospel. So the, the Jewish and the Christian scriptures, mm -hmm. um, certainly relevant for them if we can show this. Uh, because Islam, Islam claims that Jesus... Uh, not only didn't die, that but that he wasn't crucified at all. So mm. if it's not just, so one, you have Christians claiming it, right, as a doctrine. Two, you have uh, clearly in the Gospels, Jesus was crucified. And so if now you also have the Old Testament claiming that the Messiah was going to die or that this was necessary or we have prophecies of it or something like that, that's going to be relevant to Muslims. And even to atheists, if you don't believe in the supernatural and yet we have fulfilled prophecies, then you've got some splaining to do. So, all right, what do you got? What 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 passages would you be going now? Now, keep in mind, I'm obviously in a much longer live stream. There's all kinds of things, but in yeah. a sh in a short one, what 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 would be the key passages you'd go to? Yeah. Well, let me say this real quick before I give the pass some passages in the Old Testament. Um, when we say like it's important that Jesus died for our sins, like people have to think about what we mean by that, right? We're saying that like I sinned. I deserve to die, right? Instead, Jesus dies in my place, right? Receiving the, the punishment I would have received, dying for my sin. That's the idea. This is like that my forgiveness is accomplished in part by him getting punished or receiving the punishment would be a better, more accurate way to put it um, for my sin. So when Jesus we say Jesus died for sins, that's what we're talking about. And I think just about every Christian goes, yeah, duh. Duh, like that's obviously, that's what we mean. But there are a significant number of people trying to challenge this and sort of reinvent the meaning of the cross. Or I should say, strip it of a lot of its meaning and then the rest of it just doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so one of the places we have to go to is the Old Testament sacrificial system. And when we look at the system of sacrifices, you know, all that Levitical law stuff that people are like, oh, why is this in here? How does this have to do with anything? I think what God was doing was by example after example, he's drilling into them pictures and types that would be fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. And what we see in the sacrificial system is that the animals, in many cases, in, in particular Passover and the Day of Atonement, in these two particular places in the Old Testament, we have Passover and the Day of Atonement where there is a penalty being suffered by the animal so that the people might be forgiven. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because that's really exactly what Jesus comes and fulfills when he's like, I'm the Lamb of God. 
So in the Passover, the, the people had to sacrifice because the angel of death is going to come over and destroy the firstborn of every household. And they're in trouble because according to the Old Testament, they too were going after these Egyptian gods. Otherwise, they wouldn't need to do the sacrifice. But if you're in the home that's covered by the blood, guess what? He's going to see the blood, the, the penalty's already been paid, and then it's going to pass over. So there's this like penalty aspect you know, in the Passover sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And then in the Day of Atonement is the other one. Yeah. Now, what, what, what's really cool is, is Jesus as the Lamb of God, uh, that he's identified as the Lamb of God by John the Baptist in John 1. And that's relevant because, yeah. you know, a lot, a lot of what he's saying, mm -hmm. I, I, where, wherever necessary, I'm going to tie it into Islam because I deal a lot with his, Islam. Mm -hmm. But um, John the Baptist in John chapter 1 um, identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And why that's relevant is if you know where Muslim apologists like Zakir Naik go to find prophecies about Muhammad in the Bible, um, one of the most popular places to go is John chapter 1. Now, I, I, you, you, you have to either be completely ignorant or absolutely deceptive to go to a chapter like John 1 to defend Islam, right? I mean, it, it, the, the first verse begins by, by identifying Jesus as God. Later in the same chapter, it's the Word, which is God, taking on flesh to enter creation. So this is Jesus, um, repeatedly identified as God in that chapter. And then they'll go to they'll go to the small passage where the Jewish leaders come to John the Baptist and say, um, "Are you the Messiah? Why don't you tell us?" And he says, uh, "He's not the Messiah." And they say, "Are you the prophet?" And he says, "No." And so, uh, or, or are you Elijah? So those are the three options. Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? And so Zachary and I will go, aha, so there were three coming, right? So if Jesus is the Messiah, the prophet has to be someone else. And they'll go to this passage and try to prove that this is a prophecy about Muhammad. They'll ignore everything that's said up until that passage, up until that part. But then right after that passage, you have John the Baptist, who's the one speaking there, who identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. And they'll completely ignore that. They'll never tell their followers about that. They'll just quote the passage that they think they can twist into mm -hmm. something that fits mm -hmm. with their religion. And they'll completely ignore John the Baptist mm -hmm. identifying Jesus mm -hmm. as the Lamb of God who takes away yeah. the sin of the world. And again, what would that what would that mean? So now that's that's exactly the beautiful thing about it. We get this idea of a lamb taking away sin in the in the Old Testament, in the law of sacrifices, that's this concept is entirely Jewish. It's entirely Old Testament. It's just steeped in Old Testament. So in the Day of Atonement, this is like most clear. In the Day of Atonement, it's very clear that it's the sin of the people that will be dealt with on this day. And the atonement will will um, deal take the sin away from people <clears throat> and it will you know, restore God's favor upon the people after their sin has lost that, so to speak, to put it clumsily. Now, the way it's done is that there's this animal it's brought before the congregation and the priest lays his hands on the animal. And the term there is he presses down on the animal and he confesses the sins of Israel over the animal. This would have taken a while. It was once a year they did this. He confesses the sins over the animal and then he kills the animal. And then the people, they're, they're being forgiven for their sin. A second animal is sent away. It's called, we call it the scapegoat, right? It's released off into the wilderness to show that their sins have been carried away, right? Th this is... It's beautiful. And the thing is, you know, in, in the studies I've done on this topic in great detail in several videos, we get into really intricate details, all the specific texts and the Hebrew terms and stuff that support this. But the idea here is that um, what Jesus did on the cross is, is, is pictured with, I think, inarguable. I mean, you can't argue this and be reasonable <laughs> clarity that this sacrificial animal is taking punishment for your sin so that you can be totally forgiven. It's beautiful, but it's just a picture of what Christ actually does on the cross. And the New Testament ties Jesus, in fact, Jesus himself does this. Maybe I'm jumping ahead of us, but he ties himself to the Passover and to the Day of Atonement. Hebrews ties him to the Day of Atonement more than anything. I mean, there's a whole chapter on Jesus being the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. And, um, and, and then there's, of course, Isaiah 53, which we'll come to hopefully momentarily. Uh, yeah, we're going to need to because uh, you have, you're going to have some naysayers here. The sage of synergism says Jesus did not, Jesus did die, but penal substitution is still a lie. Do you believe that penal substitution is, is a lie? 
Uh, no, I, I think it's entirely true. But let me describe what it is because we haven't used the term actually yet. Yeah, that's so good. And, and and keep in mind, yeah, we since we have viewers from around the world, we have uh, we have lots of people and uh, lots of people have never um, even uh, English speakers never studied theology and don't know what yeah. don't know what some of these terms mean. Yep. Uh, but also people for whom English is a second or or third language. Oh, hang on, where oh, we we were rendering that we were buffering there for a second. If we keep buffering, I'm gonna I'm gonna lower <laughs> the uh, lower the settings. Um, but uh, yeah, so there were people for whom uh, English is a, a second or even third language. And so mm. what is that? OK, so penal, it's, it's, it's the word having to do with penalty. Think the word penalty, right? You're being penalized. You're being punished, so to speak, for something you've done wrong. And so when I say that, I'm saying that Jesus suffered the punishment for my sin. My sin deserves judgment from God, deserves death. Jesus suffers that. So he gets the penalty. The word substitution refers to someone being in your place, like they go instead of me, or they go on my behalf, in my place. So Jesus suffers the penalty for my sin in my place on the cross. On the cross, it's as though I died, right? When I put my faith in Christ, that's why we can say I died with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, because he was definitely my substitute. And the part that people actually tend to debate isn't the substitute part, it's the penalty part. And that's why I went to two passages from the Old Testament that thoroughly support that penalty was in view in those sacrifices, which the New Testament ties to Jesus very clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So uh, did you have more along to say along those lines or did you want to jump on Isaiah 53? Um, yeah. Well, I guess I'll just mention what I already said in case anybody missed it. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Day of Atonement, when the uh, priest lays his hands upon the animal and confesses the sins of Israel upon the animal and then kills the animal, these are indications that this is having to do with penalty for sin. And this, this seems to be the obvious reading of the passage. I think argument against penal substitution comes from people who um, uh, usually they don't like it ahead of time. Then they find a way to argue against it. Then other people hear them and get all confuzzled on the topic, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. All right. Well, you do have the time here right now to defend your view, taking us through Old Testament, New Testament, church fathers, however you want to do it. All right. Where you want to go next? Um, I think the, the next thing is Isaiah 53. So Isaiah 53 takes this concept of the law and of these sacrifices that are being penalties so that you can be forgiven, and it applies it to the Messiah, to the coming Messiah. Isaiah 53, you guys, you guys know the passage, um, you know, who has believed our report? I could read, read part of it to us here at least. Who's believed what he's heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. That's a key phrase. That's Isaiah 53, 53 verse 5. Talking about Jesus Christ, it's saying he bore our griefs. Bore, this idea of bearing is really important here. And he carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement or punishment that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. So we thought he was being punished because of something he did. But in fact, he received punishment because of our sins. This is penalty in substitution. He's received being the penal substitution for us. Then it goes on. It says, um, all we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all on him. Well, this idea of laying iniquity on people, this is why I gave you the description of the priest laying his hands on the sacrifice and confessing the sins of Israel. He's putting their sins upon them. The only other time in the, in the Old Testament where somebody bears sin or has iniquity laid upon them is the high priest themselves when they, when they perform their duties going into the Holy of Holies. They're bearing the sin of the people. So Jesus, he's the high priest and he's the Passover lamb. He's the high priest and he's the day of atonement sacrifice. Um, the indications are over and over that what Christ is experiencing here is the penalty for my sin. This is an important doctrine in Christianity. It's thoroughly supported in Old and New Testament. And there's actually a lot more in Isaiah 53 uh, to break down. But <clears throat> one of the things I'll point out real quick is Isaiah 53 uses a specific term that we don't know because, well, we're Gentiles and we're reading the Bible in English, most of us, um, or at least not in Hebrew. And it uses a term for, um, for, for a sacrifice, a type of sacrifice in the Old Testament. Uh, when it says that the Lord would make him an offering for sin, that's a Hebrew term for a guilt offering. And that word is used specifically for a penal substitutionary kind of offering, one that removes sin. There's different kinds of offerings in the Old Testament. Some were like peace offerings. Some were like fellowship. Like you just give out of joy to the Lord, like in a sense of fellowship. But some of them were to deal with your sin. 
right? And Jesus in Isaiah 53, he is the sin offering, the one who's going to take away our, our wickedness. Um, and, and that's a real significant thing. It does take a lot of unpacking this kind of, a, I'm sort of summarizing my points for you here, but I, I think that the, um, the evidence is overwhelming. It comes from lots of different places in the text of scripture to support penal substitution or Jesus dying for my sin. And uh, what, what's really what's really cool about that passage, Isaiah 53, I, I encourage you, if you, guys, if you haven't read Isaiah 53, so we're talking Old Testament prophets here. If you haven't read Isaiah chapter 53, read it. And if you have read it, if you have read it, be sure to read it again. This is a, a very powerful passage. And I've been in I've been in um, multiple situations um, where this passage has been uh, has been very very helpful. Sam Shimon and I have mentioned this before. Sam Shimon and I were talking to a uh, a woman who had converted to Islam based on the guys. What the heck? I'm gonna go. Hang on. I'm going to regulate. Go ahead. Talk to All right. Let me let me tell you right now. So my channel is Mike Winger, and you can go there and subscribe right now. Um, so Isaiah 53. I'm going to give you a verse I was just reading, just referencing to you guys. It's Isaiah 53:10. And it has this phrase in it, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, and regulate, <laughs> when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. That phrase, offering for guilt, that's a technical term in the Hebrew um, Bible, in specifically the Levitical law, for something which is, is, is a ritual sacrifice guilt offering. And that's what uh, Isaiah 53 is telling us mm -hmm. Jesus is. Yeah, so what, 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 I was, uh, what I was mentioning before I had to go regulate, actually I said, guys, I'm begging, could you be, please be quiet. Um, <laughs> Uh, that uh, Sam Shamoon and I were talking to a Muslim uh, a Muslim woman. She had converted to Islam, and, and uh, it was because a, a Muslim man had um, convinced her to convert and to marry her and so on, uh, even though she was his second wife. And I don't mean he divorced his first wife. She was his second wife. <laughs> and there's wife number two right here in the, uh, in the U.S. Um, but we just had her read the passage, and we, we, she read the passage, and we said, who's this talking about? She goes, Jesus. Talking Isaiah 53, this is Old Testament. She read it and said, this is talking about Jesus. Um, my friend, Anthony Rogers, who I saw Anthony in the chat. I saw Anthony in the chat, so he might still be here. But uh, Anthony, Anthony, Anthony has some, uh, some Jewish in-laws and uh, Anthony said, I think he was talking to his, his Jewish father-in-law and uh, read the passage to him, read, the, read Isaiah 53 to him, and uh, his Jewish father-in-law said, look, don't quote the New Testament to me, man. I only believe in, in what you guys call the Old Testament. And so he actually, the passage is so clearly, clearly talking about Jesus that a Jewish believer who was hearing this for the first time thought that this was from the New Testament. So guys, gotta, gotta learn that passage. Mm -hmm. All Absolutely. right. So another thing about Isaiah 53 is that the um, some people say, okay, well, this passage, it, it sure, you know, maybe, okay, maybe it has this whole penal substitutionary context in it, and it's, it's actually throughout the passage. i just give you a couple examples. But they say, but, but it's not really about Jesus. But actually, Jesus seemed to use Isaiah, did use Isaiah 53, and the New Testament authors consistently use Isaiah 53 as the interpretive grid for understanding who Jesus was and what he was doing. In fact, the famous 1 Corinthians 15 passage, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, seems to be a reference to Isaiah 53. This is, this is uh, throughout a lot of places in the New Testament, meaning that not only does it look predictive and all that, but we, we have our New Testament inspired authors telling us, yes, this passage interprets the cross for us. So we really need to let it say what it says. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple quick questions here. Um, this one is unrelated, but we have John Wilson here. It says, Mike Winger, what's it like sitting next to a psychopath? I'm, I'm, uh, it's great. I'm, uh, he's a great guy. I just want to keep him calm and I think everything's going to be fine. <laughs> All right. Now here, here's one who, uh, that is relevant to the topic. Um, how does Jesus receive all of everyone's punishment in three days? Does hell only last three days for unbelievers? This was an objection that Nabil used to bring up to me, right? How mm -hmm. can Jesus enduring, you know, this finite amount of, yeah. of, uh, of punishment, um, how can that be the atonement for, you know, for, for us when mm -hmm. what we deserve is something, something much more than that. So what do you think about that? I mean, there, there's actually different ways people approach this question. There's like several different answers that I've heard. Uh, one of the ones I think is interesting is the idea that, you know, when Christ dies on the cross, it's actually not the equivalent of my death. It's something much more valuable. Um, so if my punishment is one thing, it's something else. So 
when you, when a, when a sinner when a sinner is punished, it is, doesn't have the same ethical value or whatever value you want to call it as when a righteous man is punished in their place. And I think we can see this. Like you go to jail for ten days, it doesn't have the same value as this totally righteous man going to jail in that person's place, whether it's for ten days or one day or for any of like the time. In Jesus's case, his his incredible value being the Son of God, being the totally pure divine one, it it sort of outweighs us. That's one way of approaching it. And, um, and, and but a little side note, um, when Nabil and I were talking about it, I think you know, I think I explained. You know, you can have a you know, you, you can have a penny or you can have a, a quarter. They're both one coin, but one is, is more valuable. And yeah. especially if you had, you know, a, a certain coin from the 1800s might be mm -hmm. worth tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, far more valuable. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about the the divine son uh, certainly yeah. would, would be of, of infinite value. Infinite value. Yeah. And another aspect is is that this question actually it might be assuming that that unbelievers are actually successfully paying for their sins when they when they go to hell. But that seems to me to be a false assumption, like, like they're successfully, like they're, they're paying off the whole debt. Jesus talked about an example, uh, going to debtor's prison and you'll stay in there until you've paid the full price. Mm -hmm. You'll stay in there until you've paid the full price. Jesus getting out, so to speak, is the price has been paid. Them staying in forever, the price is never paid. Um, so there's a debt they'll never successfully pay off. And others would say, well, they're continuing to sin and so it, it, that even makes it worse. Um, that's another angle to look at and consider it from. Yeah, uh, keep keep that in mind when when people are asking, you know, about hell and its duration. What one of the one of the one of the points to bring up is uh, you continue sinning in hell, right? You continue you railing against God and blaspheming God for forever. So it's uh, anyway, that's one point to bring up. All right, where do you want to go now? Do you want to have any more from the Old Testament, or you want to head to the New or to um, the Church Fathers? Those to me are really important. I, I, so I'm, I'm just a summary, right? We we looked at some of these like sacrifice examples in the Old Testament, how they they have penalty and substitution. And I unpack this a lot better on my channel if you're interested in more detail. Oh, oh yeah, uh, just so everyone knows, a uh, link to Mike's channel is in the description box. So um, it's good to be subscribed to multiple Christian YouTubers because we tend to focus on uh, lots of different things. So, yeah. you know, I deal a lot with Islam and, and Muslim objections to Christianity mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, Mike deals with a lot of theology and uh, difficult objections to Christianity and so on. So uh, mm -hmm. you want to check those out, especially guys, if you're watching a live stream, I have, I've, I, you know, I have a lot of subscribers, but uh, not all of them are interested in live streams. So if you're actually interested in live streams, it's the live stream Christian King here. It's the live stream king, king right now. Every, yeah, Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific time, we, we go live. Yeah, All every, right, again, every Tuesday. Links in the description box. Be sure to get that if you want to check those out. Yeah, so okay. So here's a survey of what we've done so far, right? Re recap. We showed that in you know, Old Testament, we have uh, penalty and substitution in uh, two of these sort of um, primary examples of sacrifice, in Passover and the Day of Atonement. Then Isaiah 53, it uses these concepts to show you what the Messiah is going to be like and expressly says that he's dying for our sins in our place, you know, taking the punishment for us. The New Testament then quotes Isaiah 53 to give context to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, and then you could go on. There's, there's other New Testament passages that, that in even greater detail support this. In the book of Hebrews, we get it really heavily. We get it um, heavily in, in other locations as well in the New Testament. But uh but what I, what I find actually helps people a lot is answering objections that aren't really about scripture. They're more about the concept of penal substitution because that tends to be more where, where the objections come. Mm -hmm. So there's like the snarky objections, which usually misrepresent it. Um, then there's like the real thoughtful, like philosophical kind of objections. I mean, if you guys have questions about the penal substitution, particularly objections, you know, put them in the live chat right now. We'll pull those up mm -hmm. and we'll try and do our best to give you thoughtful answers to those things. I have one that's kind of connected to this from a Muslim, Muslim woman, Diva Girl Love, asks, what happened to the people before Jesus? So if Jesus, if Jesus paid mm -hmm. for our sins, what about the people before Jesus? Mm -hmm. Are there actually people who are saved before Jesus? And if so, how's that work? Yeah, so absolutely they are saved before Jesus on behalf of the price that he was going to pay for them. I mean, it's, it, it might sound like a simple answer, but I think that's the simplest way to put it. I mean, he was going to pay for them. The Lord knew this. Abraham had faith, the scripture says. He believed God, so God accounted it to him for righteousness. Well, what about Abraham's sin? What's going to deal with his sin? Well, Jesus is. It hasn't happened yet, but Jesus is going to deal with his sin. In Romans, it says that God, he he had forbearance or he basically was patient overlooking the sins 
um, for a long time until he would deal with them on the cross, that he would then demonstrate his righteousness on the cross. Because when God judges sin, he's demonstrating his righteousness. He did that on Jesus on the cross, so he didn't have to do it to uh, Abraham. Um, all right, um, I'm going to take one more from Diva Girl Love, even though this first one was somewhat on topic because you've been talking about, uh, you know, Jesus dying for sins and so on. Um, this one is not on topic. Uh, wouldn't mind taking it right now just because we tend to give uh, Muslim friends a little more leeway uh, as they're, uh, even if they're, they're going uh, uh, off topic as long as it's, you know, something important. But Diva Girl Love here said, Jesus said, I came not to destroy the laws, but to fulfill the laws. Aren't Christians breaking the Old Testament laws. Now, I don't actually know your view on this. I'll give you my view, and then you can tell me if uh, you have a different view. But but my view is, in, in the Bible, you have different covenants, right? So there's 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 a covenant with uh, Noah, there's a covenant with Abraham, there's a covenant with uh, the children of Israel brought by Moses. But then you have, even in the Old Testament, it's prophesied that a new covenant is coming. And different covenants have different rules associated with them. So Adam was commanded to only eat vegetables. You get to Noah, he was commanded he could eat anything. Uh, Moses commanded the, the children of Israel that they could only eat certain things. Then you get to the New Testament and you have different rules still that there can be different covenants that God gives to different groups and there can be different rules that are associated with them. Um, Diva Girl Love is apparently of the view that since Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law but to fulfill the law, that he's telling his followers that we have to follow all the uh, all of the the Old Testament laws. I don't even think that would make much sense because in the same chapter, in the same chapter, he starts saying, "You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth." I tell you not to do that, right? What's he doing? So it doesn't make any sense in context. I would view the the claim that Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to destroy the law, as along the lines of him fulfilling prophecy. Um, that he's fulfilled the law, right? It's not, hey, I'm, I'm here to obey the law and everyone else is to obey the law. It's through his obedience, the law is fulfilled. We are under a new covenant that was uh, put into effect by Jesus at the cross. And so we're under that covenant and that covenant has rules associated with it, but it's not the old, it's not the, it's not the, the old covenant laws if you think it is, if you think those are eternally binding, diva girl love, you got some problems because Muhammad broke those too. And therefore, we're going to have to reject Muhammad as a false prophet if you're telling those, telling us the Old Testament laws are still in effect. But what's your view on all of that? Um, okay, my view, and, and I, I feel I don't express it as well as I should, so let me give my best shot at it real quick. Um, when Jesus said uh, that he fulfilled the law, that people often quote this passage, I didn't come to destroy the laws, but the law, but to fulfill it. Um, and they often quote it, they use it as though Jesus is saying, I didn't come to destroy the law. I didn't come to destroy the law. As if that phrase about fulfilling it doesn't mean anything. You know, it's like, that's kind of a big deal. He's claiming to fulfill the law. I personally think he's fulfilling the prophecies, the commandments, the sacrifices, all the elements of the law in different fashions because they're different elements. I think he's fulfilling all of it. Now, I think that as, as Christians, we are part of the new covenant and we are under the law of Christ. The New Testament tells us we're to, we're to walk in love. We are clearly not bound by uh, obedience to these specific laws of the old covenant or the old law of Moses. I think that's very clear in scripture and many passages. I have a series on the Hebrew roots movement to combat that teaching that I think is false. Um, but the way in which you, in a sense, you can say that we are obeying the Old Testament law. There's a sense, and this is where it gets tricky. By being in Christ who has fulfilled it on my behalf, I am in fulfillment of the whole law every moment of the day, but not through my obedience to it, through his. So the particulars of the law, all of them, are fulfilled in Jesus, and I stand in that. And I don't offer a sacrifice because Jesus is my Passover lamb. And I don't need to have the food purity laws because Jesus makes me pure. You know, and I, I don't need to walk in obedience to like all of the particulars, those kinds of things that represented him because I have him. So I, I stand in a greater fulfillment. I'm walking in a better obedience to the law than, than what Moses was doing it, mm. because I now have Christ. So I, I think that's the tricky part to try to explain um, what it means to be in Christ is I'm standing in that full, constant fulfillment of the law that he has. Um, <clears throat> checking out some more comments here. We might get to some. All right. Where do you want to go from here? Uh, um, I was hoping to get some objections. So like, for instance, let's see, what are some of the, some of the objections we hear? Um, 
penal substitution is wrong or the idea that Jesus died for my sins is wrong because God would be punishing the son and the son's innocent. And to punish the innocent is injustice. So that this view requires an injustice. Like there's like a, a, a moral problem with the thing that's happening here on the cross. I love it when Muslims bring that up because it shows they don't know, they don't know their own scriptures uh, and what their own prophet said and how when they make that sort of claim, they've condemned their own prophet. But go ahead and if- uh, I'm if curious our, to know if, how what they if did. If our Muslim <laughs> friends want to bring that up, happy to cover it. Yeah. No, go ahead. I'm curious to know. I really want to know what, 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 what the story there is. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting though is this, is that this requires a retributive, retributivist view of punishment, right? But almost everyone who denies penal substitution will say that they actually deny a retributist view of punishment because they'll turn around and say, you don't need to be punished for your sins because you don't need to have to punish everyone who sins. So that's retributivist. That's like you get what you deserve view, right? But when it comes to Jesus, there's suddenly a, you get what you deserve view. Jesus doesn't deserve that. He can't get that. But you deserve punishment from sin, but, but you don't have to get that. So this mm -hmm. is like an unfair view. Um, there's a few different ways to look at that. One view is to be careful and say, um, Jesus isn't being punished. He's suffering the punishment for our sins. And that's a nuanced way to look at it. So I, so the punishment's not directed at him. The punishment's experienced by him. And there's a significant difference there. Um, I'll, you could consider that. Another way to look at it um, about Jesus being punished is that it's vicarious. And for this, we talk about liability. There is such a thing in law as vicarious liability. We actually, we have laws on the books for this, even in criminal law, like respondeat superior, I believe is the term that they'll use for it. This basically means that a boss can get in trouble for what the employee does. And this is really important to understand, even if they didn't do anything criminally wrong when the employee did that. If they have either the right or the, resp or the ability um, to have stopped the employee's behavior, they could be held accountable in court. Now, this is really important because the courts will differentiate. They'll actually say, we're not saying you're actually guilty, right? Because that wouldn't be vicarious liability. That would be criminal liability. That was, that's a whole different kind of liability. They're saying that we're going to hold you accountable, you know, because you represent them in this fashion. And this is, this is really what we see happening on the cross. Jesus isn't just a guy going in my place. He is the new Adam, right? He, he is the one who comes to represent all of mankind on our behalf. He stands there as the representative for mankind. The only reason why his punishment or him experiencing punishment makes sense is because he's going on our behalf. We get this when you pay someone else's fine and no one complains about that. And ultimately we get this uh, in Christ. So I, I think it, when you flesh out this idea of liability, we, uh, we see that it, it's a concept that makes sense. You can't say it's irrational. We certainly do it in our culture as well. All right, here you have one. Uh, but it's an objection to what you just said. Roger Shaw said, did the guest just say he walks closer to God than Moses did because he lives in Jesus? Not trying to be negative, but lol, I understand what he means. Just easy to take that the wrong way. Yeah. But uh, uh, I believe you'd, you'd have the same thing in the words of Jesus when he's talking about John the Baptist. No one uh, among those born of women. Jesus said, no one is greater than John the Baptist. And yet... He who is least in the you say he who is least in the kingdom of God is, is greater, greater than him. Yeah. So it sounds like Jesus is saying that those who are in the kingdom of God through the gospel are greater than John, who is greater than everyone born of a woman. Obviously, Jesus in that he's assuming his own divine nature. Yeah. By the way, uh, because even though he's 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 physically born, he's not. That's not really his. That's not really when he was born. So he's pointing out that. Uh, among those born of women, John the Baptist is greatest, and yet he's saying that that those who are least in the kingdom of heaven are even greater than him. So, Roger, sounds like Jesus is is uh, is on Mike's side. But what do you think? <laughs> um, well, I, I also want to point out that's actually not what I said. I didn't say I walk closer with God. I said I, I'm walking in greater fulfillment of the law than even Moses, who would have failed in some points here and there, because I'm walking in Christ, who has fulfilled it completely. So really all I'm saying is Jesus fulfilled the law more than Moses did. That's all I'm really saying. And I'm in Christ, so I have that fulfillment. Um, but the idea that you were getting at was also very interesting. Yeah. Um, strange comment here. Denise said, David, please tell us if you see our questions and comments here, even if we're not paying. If I had five bucks, I would give it to you. I don't think I've taken any questions from the Super no. Chat. I think I've been taking all of those. She just says, if I had five bucks, I would give you two. Okay. 
She yeah. would keep three and give you two, but that's still very nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the point is, I haven't been taking any questions from the super chat. I've just been focusing on questions that I'm that I'm seeing. With that said, guys, I don't see most questions. If you see, they scroll very, very quickly here. So if we're talking at all, or it's just hard to, uh, yeah. and it's hard to talk while reading questions. We have to kind of glance over there. And and, and plus, when I'm down here, everything is crammed onto a screen. So I have uh, I have up here, I have uh, the screen that that's being recorded, and I have the screen. Uh, that we're watching on YouTube and I have some chats over here and some chats over here and then the controls up here for the microphone and the controls down here. So normally when I'm at home, I have a big, a uh, uh, big um, uh, IMAX screen in front of me and I have a laptop open for other stuff. Everything is crammed right now. So going to be a little difficult to see most comments, but we'll get to those that we can. All right. What do you got? Um, there was a question down here um, or over here. Is it, go up here. Uh, yeah, scroll up. This guy had a question. The super chat? Yeah. Just when I said I didn't take questions from the super chat, you got to point to a question from the super chat. Let me see if I. Can I don't even do super chats on my live stream. So. <laughs> amateur hour. So man. don't amateur hour. Yeah. All right, let's get this one up on the screen here. I just don't like him. <laughs> All right, Andrew says, uh, "Hi, David and Mike. How would you answer the question?" of what happens to people who have never had the chance to hear the gospel. This sounds like related to the question of Diva Girl Love. I've never been able to give a satisfactory mm -hmm. reply to friends who ask me when they quote John 14, 6. And by the way, this is, uh, this is cool because um, uh, Andrew, uh, last night, Andrew last night was the one who said he was uh, sort of on lockdown in China because of the disease mm -hmm. and that uh, he, was in, he was encouraged by yeah. uh, videos and so on. Good, man. Good. Glad you're with us. Mm -hmm. All right. What do you think about that? Um, so I, I have a video on this on my channel and I go through it in great detail and it's a biblical survey of passages that help us answer this question using several examples from the Old Testament because I'm, you know, these are people before Christ. They'll give us examples of this kind of thing. They never heard the gospel. The gospel wasn't around being preached. So um, that's called, uh, what about those who never hear the gospel? That's the video name and you're welcome to look at it. Check it out. And I hope it's a blessing to you, but I'll, I'll say this. Um, people aren't judged for things they didn't hear. They're judged for the things they did. They're held accountable for what they knew, what they were accountable for, but they could give an account for. And so there is a possibility. I mean, well, look at Abraham. Abraham didn't understand the full gospel of Christ, right? But he did have a certain amount of information from God, which he believed and trusted in the true God who would send his son to die for us. So he had accurate, accurate faith in the, in, in, in the true God, you know, and he's living that way. And so, I, I mean, we have examples like that. Nahum in the Syrian, he comes to Elijah from Syria, and he comes to Elijah, and he's a leper, right? He's, he's like, I, I want to be healed of this leprosy. And Elijah's like, oh, go, you know, go take a bath in the Jordan. Go dip in the Jordan seven times. And he gets all offended. We got better rivers in Syria. I came all the way here. He won't even talk to me. He just sends a servant to tell me to go jump in the water. And he gets all offended, and his servant's like, hey, you know, if he would have told you to do some great thing, you would have done it. He just told you to go in the water. Just be humble and do it. He's like, okay. So he goes, and he, he gets in the water seven times. And he's fresh like a baby, right? And he's totally healed. He now believes in the God of Israel. This is what seems to be clear in the text. So here's a, a Gentile. He's not even converting to Judaism, but he believes in the God of Israel. And he then goes to Elijah and his whole thing, he's not told to, to he has to know the law and follow all the law and all this kind of stuff. He's, he just has faith. And he's, he's just like, Elijah, can I take some dirt with me? I just want to have a place where I can like worship the God of Israel. He's like giving faith to the true God. And Elijah's like, yeah, go your way. So I think that I think that this is like an example of somebody who was saved with with what we would consider a major lack of knowledge, but still some accurate knowledge. I think anyone who responds truly to the revelation of God in creation, the con the consciousness showing that man has sinned, is going to be on that path towards a, the at least the potential of having saving faith. But the important thing to know is that it's only Christ that saves these guys, and that every one of these guys they will, upon knowing more about Jesus. They will believe in him, right? Abraham or Jesus says like, hey, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Meaning that if you have faith in what God has revealed, you will have faith in the further revelation when Christ comes. Um, I'm sure there's a hundred more things I should say about this, but what do you think? So it's, it's not so as far as reconciling the passages, it's not that these people are saved apart from Christ. They're still only coming to Father through Jesus, but yeah. we, we, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but the blood of Christ is applied to them because they responded to the revelation that they had. Yeah. Something like that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly the, the idea. Like, and, and the reason why I bring up Jesus saying, like, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Here's, here's an interesting principle. He's like, if you would have responded rightly to what God did show you, 
when I showed up, you would believe me. Now here's Abraham responds rightly to what God shows him. Moses responds rightly to what God shows him. When later after dying, they encounter Christ, they're already in a faith position towards him. They just don't have the details yet, right? Like I, I trust in the God who's revealed himself here. I just, I don't know all the details yet, but of course they're going to continue believing um, because they're on that trajectory, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and this is clumsy stuff to talk about, I imagine, but but I do think I can build a, I build a solid biblical case for this in that video. Uh, what about those who never hear the gospel? No, I mean, I, I think I think it follows. If you if you if you know that there are uh, what do we call them Old Testament saints, mm -hmm. uh, so people who are saved in the Old Testament, and you know we know that there are Jesus refers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, so we know that there are, and if Jesus simultaneously says that no one comes to the Father except through Him. That means that even people who haven't re haven't seen the full revelation of the gospel uh, can never, nevertheless, um, uh, reach the Father through Jesus by uh, responding to the revelation that they've received. And so, your view is that a person who is is it your view that a person who's never heard the gospel, he grows up on a desert island, can nevertheless. I mean, in in theory, you could have no just you know. Uh, scriptural revelation but you could you could grow up know that there is a moral law know that you have a creator know that you violated that law know that you can't be good enough on your own know that you need righteousness from somewhere else and just cry out to god for forgiveness and yeah maybe that person uh, get is, I, reaches the father mm -hmm. but it's because what christ did is applied to him yeah. as well and, and I, I should admit this is that's a controversial idea but i yeah, do, I, I think I, it's biblical yeah i, 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 I can't i can't say i know that 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 what i just said is correct but it would seem to follow again if we have old testament saints yeah. and we have no one comes to the father but through christ then even the old testament saints before you know jesus death but death for sins and so on we're still yeah. only coming to the Father through Christ, and yeah. so it seems, even though the even though these passages aren't addressing, you know, what about a guy who who is is raised on a desert island or something like that? Um, the same would would seem to follow there. But yeah, now I want to add one thing real quick, which is some people think that what we're saying by this or what I'm saying by this, because um, I don't want to say you're signing up with what I'm saying, but uh, what I'm saying by this, they'll, they'll think that I'm saying. Oh, so like a sincere Muslim, a sincere Buddhist, a sincere pagan in Roman times. And I'm saying, uh, no, actually, because idolatry or, or, or false religions are a rejection of the truth that God has revealed. So if you see a, in a pagan environment, when you see in a, a polytheistic idol worshiping environment, you see a guy doing this, responding to the true God of creation. He's abandoning the paganism. He's rejecting the idols and he's trusting in the real God. So you wouldn't see them conforming. You don't just look for sincerity. You look for the response to conscience and trust in the true eternal God. You know, those are the kind of things you look for. Um, now, for those like say, what about uh, Islam? Well, the problem with, the problem with Islam is that embedded in the doctrines of Islam is an outright rejection of the gospel of Christ, right? That, that, and this is this is embedded in the theology of Islam. It's a, it's Jesus never died for my sin. His identity isn't what it what it truly is. So you um, you can't. You can't square this with this idea at all. Yes, yeah, so this is not embracing false religions. It's saying that I can have a, a knowledge of God without having total knowledge of the gospel of Christ. I, mm -hmm. I can still be saved. Um, another question from Diva Girl Love here. If Jesus was God, then the Bible is lying, saying that no one has seen God and lived. Diva Girl Love. Um, you, 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 please, I'm, I'm just, please try to try to understand the passages you're reading instead of going to like lame Islamic websites and getting your view of these scriptures. Um, if if you think that no one can see God and live means that no one can ever see God in the Bible, what do you do all the times that God appeared to people? That starts in the opening chapters of Genesis, right? God would walk in the garden with them, right? So what does that mean? Now, I'd be interested in your perspective, but, but my view is that kind of no one can see God in all his glory, but that God can certainly, obviously, and indisputably appear to people if he wants to. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's my view. So, Diva Girl Love, God appears to people over and over and over again in mm -hmm. the Bible, but he's taking on some sort of form where we can see him. If we were to see God in all his glory, the idea is if you're a human sinner, uh, you're, you're just, it's, it's, it's it's going to mess you up there. 
So again, please actually try to understand the passages and not just go with, with the interpretation that's given to you uh, on some silly Islamic website. Um, what your reaction should be, your reaction should be, if you're getting your, whatever websites you're getting your information from, or whatever videos of Muslim apologists are telling you, ah, this refutes Christianity. Uh, your reaction should be, after doing this over and over and over again, and seeing over and over and over again that these people are misrepresenting and completely distorting scripture, and that it's very easy to refute their claims, you should be thinking, maybe I shouldn't be going there for my information about Christianity. Maybe I shouldn't be going to lame Muslim websites to get my information about Christianity. Maybe I shouldn't be going to people like Zakir Naik to get my information about Christianity. Maybe I should try reading this for myself. The problem is, if you did read it for yourself, and you then went to these guys, you'd end up re you'd end up rejecting Islam. So we hope that's the path that you're on. All right, what do you got? Where do you want to go next? Want to go to questions or? Yeah, let's do let's do uh, Q and A stuff. All right. <laughs> All right. So we got to find some questions here. Um, you want to look over here, and I'll look uh, look here. Um, <clears throat> wait, how long is it? We are at we are at nine thirty, so we've been going about an hour. Uh, we'll probably stop at some point in the next um, half hour or so. But we're, we're looking at your guys' live chat right now. Go ahead and send us some uh, some thoughts. Yeah, guys, go ahead and questions. send us any questions you have. I, I basically, I'm way behind on questions, so I'm going to uh, kind of scroll to the end to get to the new ones here. Um, <laughs> check out a Google user here. Google user says, 420,000 subscribers. Let's do more cat viral videos and get to 1 million in six months. When I say cat videos, I mean cat walking cutely on Qurans, cutely. cats seated on Qurans, cats jumping onto Qurans. You know what he's talking about there? Oh yeah, I saw those. I oh, saw you those saw ones. those? Yeah. I, guys, I, I don't, I don't want to make videos like that, right? It never crosses my mind. I'm going to make a video of a cat walking on a Quran. It's only when you're, only when Muslims spam all my videos telling me that uh, that this video showing that a cat will not walk on the Quran is their new proof of Islam, then you're putting it forward as a scientific experiment. What's cool is the original video where that was where that was posted. Uh, now if you go there uh, in the, uh, I think in the uh, in the description it says, oh, is it in the description? I, I, somewhere somewhere on there it's saying, uh, okay, I understand that you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing this and so on, because people jumped all over him yeah. saying, you're the one putting this out here as an experiment. Now there are all these videos going around of people, you know, yep. showing that a cat will walk in the crowd. That, did, that didn't go well. Yeah. There, there, <laughs> see, there's another one that people have sent me that, uh, it's, uh, if you write out the name Allah in Arabic mm -hmm. in bird seed, in bird seed, then, uh. If, if you write out the name Allah in bird seed, then uh, pigeons won't eat it. And it shows pigeons eating a pile of food right beside the name of Allah written in bird seed, and the pigeons won't eat the name of Allah. Now, it's clear they put some sort of pigeon repellent or something like yeah. that. But it's just amazing that they're basically they're basically inviting people like me. But this is perfect if, if I understand Islamic thinking because they see Arabic as like a holy kind of language. So to write his name in Arabic kind of moves towards that superstition, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it is very, very strange stuff like that that becomes uh, the the evidence, the evidence. Did you want to do um, that one? There's a, yeah, I, I actually, I see several here. But oh. uh, it, it is very strange that those things become, and, and really they have to because the arguments that they use, you know, the perfect preservation of the Quran, all these things that they've been using for years, these are being undermined left and right. And yeah. so the younger generation of Muslims is constantly in a, state of, you know, why do we believe in Islam? Everything that we've been told is all What do you think the strongest, destroyed. what's the strongest argument they bring in support of the Quran? Uh, none. Uh, I, I think that, it, you know, and, and guys, when- Because I, I, I did my homework, I was like, I want to find the best arguments I can. And I saw, I, I looked everywhere, I finally found a video of a guy and he was like, because the Quran is beautiful. It's that, the that, most that, beautiful the, book. And I was argument. like, is he serious? Like, is he real? Is he, and I thought, I don't know how to respond That's the to that main argument of the Quran. The main, the main arguments of the Quran are, are that, which I call the argument from literary excellence, that it's so, it's so wonderfully written that it can only come from God. I'm like, but um, I've read it. Yeah. So I don't understand that argument. Well, then, yeah, here, here the claim would be, you know, it only works in Arabic. So there you have to, now, now the problem is I once listened to large passages of the Quran in Arabic. I was on a long ride and I was like, let's, let's see how wonderful this is. It just gave me a massive, horrible headache. So I don't, and by the way, by the way, the, the, there, you, I don't know if you know this, but there are people who, uh, they just like the sound of certain languages and so yeah. on. Like they hear French and it's like, oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, Irish. Uh, my, uh, I, know, I know a guy named, Usama, I know a guy named Usama Dakdok. 
yeah. uh, who's an, an Egyptian. And he said he was talking to, to, uh, to an American who was saying, you know, when I just, when I hear the Quran, it's, it's so beautiful. It's so amazing. It's just, it's, uh, you know, I just get this overwhelming feeling. And, and uh, Usama goes, so when you hear things like this, and he starts talking to him in Arabic, he goes, he talks to him for a while in Arabic. And he goes, so that, that's what you find impressive? He goes, yeah, it's so beautiful. And he goes, I just said, I want to chop your head off, drink the blood that's pouring out of your face, like said all of this horrible stuff. Yeah. And it's just a guy who thinks, you know, Arabic language is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, I think that is a horror. I mean, put it this way. If the Quran were the most amazingly written book ever. Yeah. That still wouldn't make it from God, right? I mean, it's like that. That would be like saying, but, you know, but, that 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 yeah. uh, that that Mozart's symphonies are so beautiful, they must come from God. Yeah, no they, they one, must no be divine because they're beautiful. Yeah, so so uh, beautiful girls must be godly. Yeah, so yeah, so <laughs> notice it's that sort of reasoning, right? Well, yeah. So one, even if it were the most amazing book ever written, that wouldn't mm -hmm. mean that it's from God. But two, it's horrible. It's horrible, right? I mean, I mean, and, and I'm saying that. I mean, and I'm here. I'm not talking about the you know, the, the poetic qualities, I'm just saying, if you're saying that it's so well written or so such a literary masterpiece, I mean, it's completely disorganized. Uh, certain passages uh, abrogate or cancel other passages, and you can't even figure out which ones abrogate or cancel which ones without going to outside sources and getting the historical background. Uh, moreover, from Muslims, we know that the uh, all these verses that we normally quote, Allah just can't say what he means. So Allah says, fight those who do not believe in Allah. We ask our Muslim friends, hey, why does your God say, fight those who do not believe in Allah? Oh, what he really means is only fight in self-defense. Well, what if, if what he really means is only fight in self-defense and it comes out, fight those who do not believe in Allah, then your God is like the worst communicator ever. And well, you know, when it says you can beat your wife into submission, oh, what well, it really means just tap her with a tooth toothbrush to show your displeasure. Well, why didn't he say tap her with a toothbrush? And so you have all these problems. You're basically saying that God is trying to say all these things and can just never mean, can never say what he actually means. And that this is evidence of, of the, uh, that it's this literary miracle. I would say, guys, it would be really good if he could say what he means. And yeah. until then, don't tell me it's a literary masterpiece. Yeah, I mean, this is why they have. To, I mean, they have to punt to Arabic because they're like, "Trust me, yeah. it's beautiful." Like, take my yeah. word for it. I know it. It doesn't look beautiful that, that, in any translation you have access to, but trust me, it is amazing. Yeah, that's that's an extremely important point uh, because here's here's how it works, right? They say, "Ah, the Bible contains prophecies about Muhammad." Then we look those up. No, it doesn't. Oh, the Quran's been perfectly preserved. So we look up the history of the Quran. No, it hasn't. And so they go one claim after another, after another, after another. Every one of them, we look it up, we research it, we find out it's completely false. Mm -hmm. And then they get to, oh, the Quran is a literary masterpiece in Arabic, but you can't understand it, but trust us on this. Wait a minute, you just gave me 20 arguments. Every one of them turned out to be completely ridiculous. And now you're telling me that you're, you're the guys to trust here on, on the success of the argument. No can do, my friends, no can do. All right, let's, uh, is this the one you wanted to check out? Um, sure. I was just, I was looking for a question and I found one. So. Oh, actually, well, yeah, we'll look at questions over there. So I'm not, probably won't put these on the screen because, uh, wait, let me get over here. Probably won't put these up on the screen because we can read them a little faster yeah. if we're, uh, we're just scrolling through them. I, um, while you're finding one, I'll just do one real quick off the cuff. Someone says, uh, when can I do a video about Eastern Orthodoxy? I, I honestly have no idea. I don't know enough about it and I would have to do a lot of homework to make sure that I'm really representing it correctly and thoroughly. Uh, but I do see the need. I think there's a great need. I see that there's a need for a, a, hopefully a thoughtful, discerning, gracious video dealing with the topic. And I will keep that in mind for the future. Um, how about this one? Um, Cereal Bowl says, question, why did Jesus curse a fig tree? Now, I would, I'd be interested in your understanding of that, but I, 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 I've always thought that he's trying to set an example for his followers and that he taught them about uh, a good tree bearing good fruit and a bad tree bearing bad fruit. And he's trying to give them a visual example. So, sort of similar to what he did in, uh, in John 13, right? Where he's about to go away and he, he does this little, I, I think of it as a one man play where he, it says he took off his, his outer garment, wrapped a towel around him and then oh, yeah. washes his disciples' I, feet. I'm in love with that passage. Yeah, I, it's yeah, I want to so make that. Yeah. And washes his disciples' feet and then puts his garment back on and then says, do you know what I just did? Do you know did? what I just did yeah. for you? And it's, all, it's oh, an awesome man. little one-man play because, it's guys, th this, is, this is where, I mean, Jesus is revealing to them that he came from the Father, sort of laid aside his glory to take on human flesh uh, to cleanse uh, to cleanse his followers and then was going back to where his glory would be his full glory would be yeah. restored and that so he he, he does this little now, play where he cool. takes off his garment and so on and so on so i think that jesus gives his followers sort of a visual 
um, examples mm -hmm. of his teachings. And so he walks by the, the, the fig tree and it's not bearing, it's not bearing fruit and curses it. So to, guys, understand you're, you're in trouble if, if you're not bearing fruit. Yeah. And I, I think there, there is now some people use this inappropriately, but I think there is a connection to Israel here. I think Jesus is coming to Israel as the Messiah. They're supposed to be ready for him. They're supposed to be receiving him and the fig tree is cursed. And this is like, look, this is what's going to happen to Israel um, because of the rejection of the Messiah and the destruction of the temple happens, you know, you know, after the death of Christ and some time goes by, there is then in 70 AD, the destruction of the temple, the ruining of Israel. But God has promised in the scripture that even though they have the utmost of punishments, he would bring them back. He's going to restore his people. So that's still in the future. It's not permanent. That's the abuse is that this is like a permanent thing or that it's total. It's not, it's not every, you know, Jewish person. It was a, a large number of them and it was uh, temporary. But yeah, so I do think it's actually uh, Israel you know, that's that's also being pictured here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you think of that? Well, think about it. Something to think about. Well, you, uh, you seem to know what you're talking about on a lot of the time. So we'll see. Maybe I'll just trust you on some. I'm pretty things. sure David, David Wood just said I'm always right. No, didn't. didn't. <laughs> that's, definitely, that's definitely what that meant. Um, how about this one? Um, when are we allowed to translate mm. some of your videos? Some countries need it, e.g. Russia. I cannot speak for Mike Winger, but he can speak for himself. Uh, Elderberry, anyone in Russia is free to take any one of my videos or any 50 of my videos, download them, add Russian subtitles all through them, and upload them to your own channels on your Russian channel. I'm not stingy with my content. You could do that all day long. You will never hear an objection from me. And that's if YouTube right. ever contacts me and says, hey, this guy's taking your content, I'll say, good, amen. Yeah, no, that's my I'll idea. say it in Russian if I can figure out what amen is in Russian. I have the exact same position. Um, as far as if people use my content to glorify Christ and for to further ministry and not for some kind of like something that I would find really objectionable, like it should be obvious what that kind of stuff would be, then I would, I'm totally happy with them doing that. They like, I, people ask me permission. Is it okay if I show your video at my church event type thing? And I'm like, dude, you don't have to ask that. You want to take it? You want to you want to take what I teach and just listen to it while you say it all in some other language to make another video for someone else? Go ahead. I don't care. I don't care if you get as long credit. as you just like send a ten thousand dollar fee per video to each of them. That's body uh, comedy. They, they'll be fine, right? I mean, it's no you gracious dude. The, million, the million dollar <laughs> apologist right there. No. Um, I, I don't I don't even care if I get credit. <laughs> you can you can steal my stuff and use it in sermons. I don't care. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I pointed that out too. So I just said uh, you're free to take my videos, download them, add subtitles. But if you want, if you want to actually translate my entire video into Russian and then repeat the entire video yourself in a video where you're sitting in front of your bookshelf and you're you're re you're just saying everything I said, but in Russian. I'm, a, I'm on board with it. I, you don't have to yeah. give me credit. I don't care. I'm never going to complain. I think How can it's we great. complain, man? That's yeah. just more ministry happening. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's like uh, I, I tell people, uh, I tell people, um, I tell people that they're free to download my videos and upload them to their to their own sites, right? And sometimes, every once in a while, I'll da I'll post a video on my channel and we get like fifty thousand views. Then someone else will post the same video on their own channel, but they'll they'll title it in a far more provocative way, David would destroy so and so on. And then it'll get over a million views. And you know, there's always that little, gosh, why didn't I get the million views on my channel? But yeah. at the end of the day, guess what? I was gonna get 50,000 on my channel. And you know, it went on to get over a million on that other channel. Yeah. So they expanded the cool. reach of your ministry. Yeah. It's good stuff. All right. Um, here you go. Here's a, here's a rough one for you. Uh oh. Uh, although it's directed towards me, but since you're here, you can answer it. Uh, Wyeth Ismail said, uh, David Wood, my friends always ask me how God could allow people who do good deeds to go to hell. Mm. What do you think about that? So think about this. You got all these nice people doing all of these great things. How could those people and all their great things that they're doing go to hell? Um, yeah, I, um, God will never send good people to hell. Never. He certainly would not send good people to hell. The, the problem is that we're not good. People aren't good. Um, and I think that what we do is we, we have like, for instance, that maybe, maybe the standard for goodness here is I did some good things, so I should be all right. But like, imagine if we played this out in real life, like I've, I've, uh, I've committed murder. I've, I've cheated on my wife, but you know what? I really donate a lot to charity. 
I'm, I'm way more gracious and giving than a lot of other people. And I would give you the shirt off my back. And I'm really a nice guy in other areas. This doesn't really do anything to unbalance the sin that I've committed or the evil that I've done. And we get this in court. Like nobody goes to court and says, yeah, I committed all those crimes. But you know what? I did a lot of other good stuff. So I should be let off on balance. Like we, I think we understand this isn't how justice works. So I would just say, yeah, God, of course God doesn't, doesn't punish anybody uh, for, think, for being good or something like that. But we have to recognize that our version of goodness is super weak sauce like when we, when we, when we have it for ourselves. It's, it's like um, you think you're a good artist. You know, I'm a pretty good artist. I draw pretty well until you meet like an impeccably good artist. And all of a sudden you're like, I'm, I'm lame. I'm so bad at this. And what we need to do is encounter the God of goodness and the God of morality and the God who establishes the foundation of goodness and realize compared to him, I'm a weasel, man. I'm, I mean, compared to him, I am a, I'm an extremely deeply sinfully flawed person. And when we see that, we suddenly realize how beautiful the cross is and the forgiveness of Christ that he gives us, how much we need it and how wonderful it is that he grants it. A uh, couple things here. We have uh, some some guy named True, who goes by True Idea Apologetics saying, hey guys. I think it's Truid. Truid, uh, I guess that's a version of Druid. Druid Apologetics <laughs> says, hey guys, when we have that dashingly handsome fellow Adam Coleman on your channels, uh, I don't know any dashing, uh, dashingly <laughs> handsome fellow named Adam Coleman. I do know a pretty hideous, Pretty hideous guy named Adam Coleman. Um, I'd be happy to have him uh, have him on to some to some live I think streams. Adam Coleman is is the Bob Ross of apologetics. I met this guy. We got to hang out during this during this like gathering we've had, and it's like he's like a calming force in people's lives. Like he caught, he just talks, and you just feel calm and peaceful. It's really nice. But he's also knowledgeable and thoughtful and all that. You guys should check him out. Just to help you go to sleep at night, I think. You know, yeah. just, just to help you feel good about things. No, it is really cool. I started, you know, I I looked up, uh, I looked up Adam. I pointed this out before. I looked up Adam because like three different people in completely different parts of the country all said, "Hey, have you been? Have you checked out this uh, Adam Coleman guy?" It guys, wasn't just guys. his three different accounts. Yeah, he, yeah, he might have, he might have, but yeah, <laughs> people have. people said, uh, "Hey, you should check out this Adam Coleman guy." Uh, anyway, pretty smart. That True was ID really is Adam Coleman's channel. You could click, you could find it in the live chat and go check out his channel. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and yeah, so, uh, basically they were, they were telling me, uh, Adam was cool based on his podcasts, which are like, I mean, gosh, what year does, what decade do podcasts come from? It's like, uh, that's like telegraph machine or something like that. But, uh, uh, cave scratches. <laughs> yeah. So Adam's sitting there, da -da 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 Jesus is Lord. Da -da 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 right. And, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so we, we've been encouraging Adam to get on YouTube and so say he's down here. Uh, and uh, I think he's going to be cranking out some uh, epic content here. And what would, you, what would you say he focuses on? Um, it, interestingly, he wants to, uh, I mean, he, he's, he, he's been dealing with all kinds of issues. Like, you know, he, he has some stuff on uh, Hebrew Israelites and uh, comedics and, so, and things like that. But uh, he, he, he wants to focus a lot on black atheism so in other words the 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 rise of atheism the, the current rise in atheism in the black community and mm -hmm. certain uh representatives of atheism who are who are focusing on the black community wants to uh to target them because when we think of atheists we want to respond to it's like you know richard dawkins and sam harris and so on yeah. uh, but there are different there are some different uh people that that we might not ne necessarily even be aware of yeah. who are in the black community reaching out saying hey we need to become atheists and so on so yeah and the and the and the the, the arguments turn out to be somewhat different like you know, a problem of evil that we would be familiar with would just be focusing on, you know, human and animal suffering in general and saying, look at all this human and animal wow. suffering. Whereas, uh, like in the African American community here, uh, you know, it would have a, it, it would have a, a sort of different thrust, right? It'd have, you know, it, it, it might be geared towards the history of slavery and so on. Uh, as far as the as far as the problem, like where's God when when yep. all of that is happening and yeah. so on. So the arguments uh, you have you have the same arguments, but they they they're they're often uh, different in certain ways. And so uh, he wants to spend a lot of time focusing on right that. On. So if you're not subscribed to True Idea Apologetics and you think you'd be interested in some of that, uh, go ahead and check him out. But yeah, no, I, I will definitely definitely unless. I die or Adam Coleman dies or one of us apostatizes, we will, uh, Adam will be appearing on some of my, uh, some of my live streams. Check this out. Now, right. I, I, just, I just want to point this out. I just want to point this out. Diva Girl Love. Cursed a perfect tree? Lol. For no reason. We already said there's a reason, right? We've already said there's a reason. But cursed a perfect tree. Notice she's complaining about a tree. 
right? People chop down trees all the time. This table's built out of wood. People, people chop trees down all the time. Here's, here's what's amazing. She's got a prophet who's killing people left and right like it's a sport, who chops the heads off of hundreds of Jews, who tells his followers they can beat their wives into submission, and who beats his wives into submission. A guy who caught, got caught having sex with his slave girl. A guy who took the wife of his own adopted son. A guy who did some of the most horrifyingly bad things. Guy, the guy who had a child brought. Your prophet climbed. <laughs> Jesus cursed the fig tree. Your prophet climbed on top of a nine-year-old girl. And here's the message. None of that matters. But that tree, <laughs> that tree, that's the problem. So that's one problem. The other problem is, where do we read about this? We read about this in what's called the fourfold gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke and John from the from the second century on, were referred to as a unit called the gospel or the fourfold gospel. Your God commands Christians to judge by the gospel. Chapter five, verse 47 of the Quran says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And if we fail to judge by the light of what Allah has revealed therein, we are no better than those who rebel, we're, we're rebels. Mm -hmm. And this comes right after the command in verse 43 of the same chapter, to Jews to judge by the Torah. Allah says, Allah tells Muhammad, the Jews do not need you, they have the Torah. So the Jews are commanded to judge by the Torah. Christians are commanded to judge by the gospel. Muslims in chapter 5, verse 48, are commanded to judge by the Quran. So we each have a revelation. And according to the Quran, all of these revelations came from Allah. No one can change any of these revelations. That's Surah 18, verse 27, Surah 6, verse 115. No one can change Allah's revelations. And so here we have our revelation, which can't be changed which we're commanded to judge by, we read it, and diva girl love mocks it. She makes fun of it, she makes fun of Jesus, she attacks Jesus, she claims to respect Jesus, she insults him, she, uh, she, she claims to obey Allah, but she, 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 she makes fun of the book that Allah commands us to judge by. Diva girl love, I hope you're at some point realizing the true spirit of your religion is to attack uh, the heart of the gospel to attack Jesus. That's why your religion uh, agrees with us on so many things. Yes, Jesus is born of a virgin. Yes, he performed miracles. Yes, he's the Messiah. Yes, he, he, he went to heaven. Yes, all of these things, except he didn't die on the cross for sins, didn't rise from the dead, and he's not Lord, which just, happened, just happens to be the heart of the gospel. That's the spirit of your religion. That's why even though you claim to respect Jesus and so on, you always end up insulting him. You always do, just like your book does. So how can this be the true religion if you cannot come up with a coherent message? You're always attacking Jesus while claiming to respect him. Uh, your God's always commanding us to judge by the gospel. You're always attacking it. It just doesn't make sense here. Sorry. All right. Is there anything you want to address? I guess we should be wrapping it up here in the next few minutes. I don't know, man. Minutes. David was just like really good at that. <laughs> just whatever just happened right there. <laughs> well, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell, tell you what it is, right? It's, it's we go on here and we say, hey... We're going to be talking about whether Jesus died for sins, right? We're going to talk about what, whether Jesus died for sins or Jesus' mm -hmm. death for sins and so on. Yeah. And it's when a Muslim comes on there and diverts the topic. And mm -hmm. I think, okay, you're trying to divert us from this topic. Wouldn't it be a perfect opportunity to raise all your objections against this, against this issue? And yeah. you raise one, and as soon as we show that we can we can answer it, then you change it and divert the topic. So it's kind of a situation where, okay, if you're here trying to divert the topic and you're going to attack Jesus, I'm going to point out you know some things yeah. about your religion and what what, what you're I, really going I was at. hoping for more actual objections to penal substitution that we could respond to, but obviously you are all convinced. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So uh, anything? Uh, I guess we'll. Well, we could do this. Uh, anyone familiar with Christus Victor theory of atonement? We could do that. Yeah, uh, Liza J. Uh, Liza J. Uh, post just posted a link to my video, uh, the Quran, the Bible, and the Islamic dilemma. So if you wanted more, you know, if you wanted references uh, that I just cited, but if you want and even more, um, there's a video: the Quran, the Bible, and the Islamic dilemma. Basically, the Quran affirms not only the inspiration but also the preservation and authority of our scriptures. And that puts Muslims in a huge dilemma because there are only two possibilities. Either we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, or we don't. If we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because it contradicts what we have. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because it says we do. And so either way, Islam is false. My Muslim friends, you need a new religion. All right, which one do you want to check out? Um, we could do this Christus Victor question right here. Uh, this one. All right, go ahead. 
Uh, okay, so this is from Cordy, and Cordy asks, is anyone familiar with the Christus Victor theory of atonement? And I just want to mention this. Now, this is going to be like, you know, maybe a bit complicated for those who it's the first time you're hearing this kind of stuff. But let me try to frame it for you. There's some who, who will say, okay, there's, there's things called theories of the atonement. This is just like explaining um, what Jesus did on the cross like, and, and, and what impact it has. Um, so these are different theories. Now, penal substitutionary atonement, that's what sometimes we call a theory of the atonement. I look at it as elements of the atonement. The atonement has a penalty involved. The atonement has substitution involved. Then there's the moral, you know, moral example theory. This is the idea that Jesus on the cross, he just is a moral example for us. And they say, well, some people say, well, that's all it is. He's just being a moral example for us. He's not like dying for my sins. He's just dying at the hands of sinners to try to provide an example to inspire us to live good lives. Well, it's really both of those things, right? It's penalty, substitution, and moral example. He did all of the above. But if you if you say moral example and you take away penalty, then you're like, wait a minute, what kind of moral example is that? Mm-hmm. It's one thing if you die for me to save me from my horrible fate. It's something else if you just die just to show me that you can die. Like, where's the more, where's the example there? Like, if I walk into a burning building and I save a baby and I die of you know choking of smoke, but I save the baby, you're like, what a moral example. But what if I just walk into a burning building and die? Is that a moral example? <laughs> it's not a moral example. Then there's another view, which is Christus Victor. And that, that view is that Jesus dominated over the powers of sin, death, Satan, and the world, all those things. And he dominated over that on the cross. Now, everyone's going to be like, well, yeah, of course he did that. I agree that he did that. The problem is when people try to promote this view as a um, way of refuting penalty and substitution. That is not something the early church fathers did. That's something modern theologians, some of them try to do. And it it's not biblical, and it, and it doesn't fit church history either, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, here's one that is uh, relevant. And guys, we got about uh, five more minutes. We're going to be closing. Actually, might go slightly over because we started actually a couple minutes after 8.30. So we've been going about 80 minutes, uh, according to my timer here. Um, fresh donuts. Says, I can use some fresh donuts right now. Did Jesus, you need about 10,000 of them if you want to get to this. This mass here. <laughs> anyway, did Jesus need to die before God could forgive? Mm-hmm. Seems to be a pretty big limitation on God. What about sure. the prodigal son? What about the teaching of the early Christian church? And so uh, mm-hmm. the first part of this is kind of related to what we were all what we've already talked about. So yeah. you can review it. Maybe uh, fresh donuts came in uh, a little late, in which case they're not so fresh. <laughs> anyway, uh, mm-hmm. but then the second part is what about the teaching of the early uh, early church? Yeah. Um, Okay, so did Jesus need to die before God could forgive? The answer is absolutely not. Jesus just needed to die in order for God to forgive. The timing of it, that's that's not like a, I can't forgive until he dies. It's just that when when I'm going to forgive you on account of the fact that he will be dying for you. That's kind of how it happens from the Old Testament perspective. It's not like God didn't know this and that this wasn't planned all the way from eternity, right? So this is always the plan, right? I mean, it's like you sit down at a restaurant and you're going to pay for your meal. You haven't paid for it yet. But because yeah, so they believe you have you'll pay for it. How do you have it? How do you have the meal? It's impossible. You have to pay up front right now. They serve you know, it to you. Yeah. You eat it. You keep ordering more stuff. The bill's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But somebody's going to pay for this thing. Yeah. But everybody knows someone's going to pay for it. So it's yeah. okay. Yeah. God knows Jesus isn't going to do a dine and dash, right? You know what I mean? All right. No dine and dash. <laughs> no dine and dash. No dine and dash. <laughs> Um, and, and so the Old Testament affirms this because Abraham was, it was accounted righteousness and all this. And then yet it was in light of the sacrifice of the Messiah. Um, so it's not a limitation on God. What about the prodigal son? The, uh, the question there, what about the prodigal son? Well, the prodigal son, there's no story of any sort of sacrifice for forgiveness. But that's because the prodigal son is not teaching us the whole theology of the cross. It's teaching us the attitude of God towards repentant sinners. That's it. It's the attitude of God towards repentant sinners. When you come to God, he will receive you right now, no matter how wicked you've been, no matter how much you've blown it, no matter how obstinate you've been, he will receive you. Um, that's the attitude of God towards, towards repentant sinners. And that's what the prodigal son story is about. It doesn't really tell you anything about the cross because it's not about the cross in particular. Um, so it's just not relevant. Um, Jesus himself said the son of man must die. And he alluded to Isaiah 53 to explain his death. So that's pretty important. Um, um, the early okay. church. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the teaching of the early Christian church, and this is what I do in my video series on this. The first video in the series is the whole is a survey of the early church, and I quote a bunch of church fathers. They did believe that Jesus was suffering uh, punishment for our sins. They say it in mi- multiple places, so we established that it was substitutionary. Eusebius gives us one of the best quotes. He actually quotes from Isaiah 53, Eusebius, 
and uh, the passage I was quoting earlier. And he very expressly says that Christ uh, died in our place, suffering the punishment for us. It's, it's, it's really st a strong quote from the early church. So there's, there's one place where they support it. Yeah. Um, this is Cordy again. Cordy said, mm -hmm. if Jesus atoned through penal substitution, doesn't that put him out of step with the type of the Passover lamb, since it's an offering without defect? I'm a bit confused by that yeah, because, so, well, let me just put it this way. Uh, G, the, the Passover lamb was out with, without defect. Now the people offering him, they had defect, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, Jesus, he's without defect or he's morally pure and perfect and holy. But the, the ones he's being offered for, offering himself for, they are with great moral defect. But that's kind of why this works because the pure uh, going in place of the impure. Yeah. I, now I'm not sure what else I might need to explain beyond no, that. I'm just, I'm just cracking up because divas... Diva Girl Love is still complaining about the, the poor little fig tree. The poor fig tree. Jesus showed that he had power, supernatural power over the fig tree. According yeah. to Christianity, Jesus is the creator of everything. He can destroy a fig tree to make an example yeah. for his followers, to show them something, to reveal something to them. Think about the moral compass in Islam where... Yes, chopping the heads off hundreds of people, beating women into submission, hiring prostitutes is okay as long as you marry them for the hour that you're sleeping for, that you're sleeping with them, right? Um, all of these wonderful things coming out of coming out of Islam. Muhammad got caught having sex with his slave girl in the bed of his wife Hafsa when she's out running some errands. She comes back, catches him in her own bed with his slave girl. She flips out. She runs and tells. Aisha and all the wives are mad at him. They keep nagging him until he says, I swear by the great God Allah, I will never have sex with this slave girl again. Then Allah comes and reveals to him the opening verses of Surah 66, verses one and two, telling him, I remember that. hey, you need to break that oath that you just made your wives because I didn't tell you to make that oath. And so you have him getting caught with his slave girl in the bed of one of his other wives and then making an oath saying he won't do it again, and then breaking that oath and Allah commanding him to do it. None of this is a problem for Diva Girl Love, but what is a problem? The poor little fig tree, which has no feelings. Well, but the, but the wives, they had feelings. The slave girl, they had feelings. None of that matters. The, the hundreds of Jews who were beheaded, they all had feelings. No one cares about it. The child bride that he climbed on top of, her feelings don't matter. What matters is the poor little feelingless fig tree gotta love Islam, man. You gotta love it. Well, I think the next time she opens the Quran <laughs> and you flip to one of the pages in it, I want you to think about the tree that died <laughs> yeah, to, to print make the that page. Quran. Poor, to print the page that you're little tree. Just, just, just think about that. Your, think your about Quran that. is printed on poor little trees. And if you look in Which the, are cursed with the, with the verses of the Quran now. It probably even has extra superfluous pages like most books, you know. Yep, completely pointless. Think about no the superfluous purpose. pages too, because there Gosh, isn't even a reason. I can't believe this religion. Yeah. <laughs> Making paper out of trees. <laughs> All right. Uh, you have a troll here called Capturing Christianity. <laughs> the horrible troll here. It's weird how many of these horrible trolls are trolling <laughs> us from this house that we're staying in. But Capturing Christianity. Guys, that's Cameron Bertuzzi. Um, Cameron kind of came out of nowhere pretty recently on YouTube, but he's killing it. He has a background in photography and videography and so on. So he's allowed, uh, he's able to make his videos just spectacular and so on. He's been going mm -hmm. around, uh, getting interviews with all kinds. Oh my goodness. That's him. It's the troll. Look how small I, he is compared to us. Yeah. Oh, notice, no. notice he's, uh, he, he, he's, he's, uh, he's sharper than, than, than Adam has been during this. Adam just, just brought things up and then didn't come over here. As soon as we were started talking to Cameron, he knew to run over here. That's oh, right. I've been waiting. I've been waiting the whole time. Why didn't, I don't know why Adam didn't come over here. He really blew it. Adam, Adam, you blew it, man. If you're watching this, you, you blew your chance. You've still got a chance to come on over here. Uh, Capturing Christianity says, here's an objection to penal substitution. Uh -oh. No one can be a substitute for sins that haven't happened yet. Well, I, I guess I have two. I've never heard that one. So here's my two thoughts That's on it one. off the top of my head, which could use refinement, I'm sure. One is, uh, why not? Yeah. Um, if Prove those, it. If those, You've got the burden of proof now, Capturing Christianity. If those things are known of. Uh, known about. And the, the second would be um, the substitution is for the people, actually not the sins. Right, Jesus is this, is our substitute, not our sins substitute. Yeah. So you're saying that you're not persuaded. 
Oh, <laughs> look at this. He said I'm right about everything. Look at this. <laughs> look at this. Now we have inspiring philosophy uh, <laughs> trolling saying Cameron needs the glasses to match. <laughs> He's saying, I know, right? Have the matching there were a lot of we match comments in there. And yeah. In some ways, we, you know, honestly, it's just the glasses. If we didn't have the glasses, nobody would think we looked. Hey, alike. wait a minute! Inspiring philosophy is a mod. If inspiring philosophy is a mod, then obviously, where'd that comment from? Uh, from Cameron go? Cameron should obviously be a mod if he. There you go. Oh, he's gonna post another one, so I, I have it. Here we go. All right, uh, all right. We are going to wrap it up here in the next two minutes or so. Um, so, um, Mike. Yes, sir. Hey, come on, come on over here, man. Say hi to everyone. This is Adam. Adam, wait, before he talks, I just want you to be be prepared to be calmed and relaxed. Oh, yeah, I, I was just upstairs working on my uh, telegraph machine for my next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Typing it out. <laughs> 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 the Morse code. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, so this is Adam Cover for the True ID. Uh, I, I'm used to saying True ID podcast, but I'm about to scrap it. So True ID Apologetics. I'm trying to crank up this stuff, man. I'm you know teaching these guys, David Wood and Mike Ray. I've been teaching them a lot this weekend about YouTube, how to get their channels in shape. <laughs> It's amazing. All that kind of stuff. How to get their podcast game up and teach school and all that. But, you know, definitely check out the channel, man. Love you guys. Awesome. All right. Peace. Now, um, I'm going to find the comment from Mr. Bertuzzi. Um, I'll help. All right. There, it is. Yep, there we go. All right. Let me uh, go ahead and uh, this way ever, all is fair. I guess I need to go to True ID Apologetics as well and make him a mod. But the bottom line is if I somehow made Inspiring Philosophy a mod, uh, all these guys that I trust even more than Inspiring Philosophy <laughs> should, be, should be moderators. That's true. Um, all right. So there we go. I'll have, to find, I'll have to find Adam. Adam, post another comment so I know where you're at. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up now. So um, final thoughts on Jesus dying for sins. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to say? Yeah. Well, let me just summarize a couple of thoughts real quick is that it's, I think Christians intuitively naturally believe this, and most who who object are are being impacted by somebody who's re reinventing it for them. Um, it's biblically faithful, Old Testament in the law and the prophets, in the words of Jesus, in the words of the of the apostles in the New Testament, and in the words of the early church. The idea that Jesus was a penalty or suffered the penalty for my sins in my place is extremely important because it's how. It's, it's not what the cross does, it's how the cross does it. And that's super important for us. Um, we, we have this idea that Jesus died for our sins, guys. He died in our place for our sins, which means that guess what? You don't need to earn it. You don't need to work for it. In fact, you can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can just trust in him who's done it all for you. Rest in the finished work of Christ. Whatever sin you've committed, you know what? Jesus already paid for that. If Jesus is worthy, then I can be forgiven. Uh, yeah, I'll just point out, um, guys... Uh... Human sinners present a problem for a perfect God, right? If God's mm. justice is perfect, that requires that all sin be punished. Uh, if God's love and mercy are perfect, then he would obviously want to forgive. So what happens when he's confronted with human beings who do horrible, horrible things? Uh, what does he do? If he forgives them, well, that's very loving and merciful, but it's not just. Um, if he just punishes them and that's it, then, well, that's, that's just, but it's not loving and merciful. So what happens? Well, God gives the solution to this problem through the gospel, where his love, mercy, and justice all meet at the cross. Um, Islam has a different solution. Islam solves the problem of God and human sinners by reducing and diminishing the attributes of God. So the God of of the Quran is not very loving. He has no love for all kinds of people. He doesn't love unbelievers. In fact, he doesn't love you until you first uh, believe in Muhammad and obey him and do all of these things. And then, then God might love you. Notice that is the sort of love that is condemned by Jesus in Matthew chapter five, when he says, hey, if you love those who love you, what are you doing more than sinners and tax collectors and everything else, right? So the kind of love that is the love of Allah, is the sort of love that Jesus condemns and makes fun of as the, the kind of love that, 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 that anyone, anyone might have. Uh, and at the same time, Allah's justice isn't perfect. Allah can just sweep some sin under the rug, doesn't care, pretend it never happened, doesn't punish it. Say whatever you want about that, but it, Allah's justice is not perfect. At the end of time, according to Islam, there will be sin that has never been punished. At the end of time, according to Christianity, all sin has been punished, and yet God did absolutely everything necessary 
to save us. So mm -hmm. that's some amazing, amazing stuff. All right. Uh, again, Mr. Wingers, Mr. Wingers information, his channel link is in the description box. So don't leave without checking that out, checking out his channel, checking out his live streams. And um, I will probably back be back in the next day or two uh, in a completely different state. We are heading to uh, Phoenix. Me and Vocab are heading to Phoenix for a uh, conference, Doctrine for the Block conference. Uh, check it out and talk to you soon. See ya.